this Christmas and every Christmas, there's no doubt that uh, many people get mentioned during the Christmas season. Mary, for sure. She gets mentioned a lot. The wise men, they get mentioned a lot. The shepherds who came to see Jesus, even though they were years later, that they came to see Jesus. So, so when the wise men and the shepherds arrived to see Jesus, he was probably already two or three years old at that time. We even talk about the animals that are in the manger. But we rarely ever talk about this man named Joseph. A man who, if you look in Scripture, says no words in the entire passage. In the entire crisis, if you will. In the entire situation or the birth of Jesus we don't see a word or hear a word from Joseph. It's unique. Now, this has nothing to do with my sermon, but let me just give you a word of advice. When you talk too much, it weakens your voice. If you got something to say about everything, when you really got something to say, no one's going to listen to you. And can I just advise you as your friend not to use Facebook. Put everything on there. I'm bored. Don't know what to do. I was at the store. I'm going to go get mail. For the love of God, what do I care? You put everything on Facebook, and when you really got something to say, no one's going to listen. Social media has the capacity to weaken your voice. Now, I think it's a good avenue, a good bridge to, to share the gospel and what God is doing, but not because I'm going to. I'm bored. I don't know what to do. Anybody, you know. And here we find in the story of Christmas a man who says relatively nothing other than his thoughts about leaving his wife. And that was in his thoughts. So this afternoon, I'm going to give you a couple things about him that we can learn this Christmas. Last week I shared with you that God, right, that nothing's impossible with God. That God's hand is not too short to meet your needs. Is there anything impossible for God? You learned last week that impossible means I am is possible because God is with me. You learned that last week. I am is with you. So if God is with you, if I am is with you, then nothing's impossible. That's what we learned last week. This week we're going to learn that I believe the plan. God has a plan for you. You hear me? Now, listen, y'all. If you don't believe that, that's the equator right there. That's the equalizer. If you don't have faith or if you don't believe, then nothing else matters. You're going to have to believe even when it doesn't make sense. You're going to have to believe even though you don't know how it's going to happen. And I try to teach you here as your pastor that the how is left up to God. So I'm going to believe that God is going to make a way when there seems to be no way. That God will give me a river in the midst of a desert. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I got to believe. And believing is the equalizer. So there's where I start. You gotta believe. And the fact that you're here today is because you believe. Amen. I believe that. <laughs> believe. You're here today because you believe that there's a God. That you were not born on your own. Now I know there's a lot of people out there in the world that don't believe in God and they don't believe in the Creator, but it always messes me up. If I see a watch. There's got to be a watchmaker. If I see a building, the John Hancock building, there has to be an architect and a builder. Because, come on now, the John Hancock did just fall down from the sky. Someone had to design it. Someone had to build it. We believe that. That, that makes sense. If I see a painting, there has to be a what? Okay, so you understand that logic. If I see... A creation, there must be a, that's right. God bless you. Merry Christmas. That's it right there. I just gave you your gift. 
There has to be a creator. It's just no way that you just fell down. With all the intricacies in your body. There has to be a creator. And God has a plan with your life. Hey, listen, y'all. You were not born by accident. No, you might have been an accident from your mom and dad and they planned it out, right? Because there were oops. You were like an oops. You're like, oops, we didn't plan this. But not with God. God has a plan for you. And that plan is to prosper you, is to bless you. And we're going to find out this afternoon a couple things from the life of Joseph, how he believes the plan. Let's go into it. Let's go into it. Here we go. Are you ready? Hallelujah. Number one, Joseph's character. Joseph's character. According to verse 18 and 19, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with the child through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. A righteous man. What makes Joseph's character intriguing is number one, or A, is that he was a man who was consecrated. You know what consecrated means? A man who's devoted. A woman who's devoted to the things of God. Somebody who lives for God. So if you're consecrated to doing the things of God, the Bible tells us in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph was a faithful man. He was faithful to the things of God. You know what that tells you and I in the year 2016? That it is possible that you and I live faithful lives in the midst of evilness. Amen. Come on, somebody. Get excited. Amen. That you and I can live righteous living in the midst of chaos. The Bible says that he was a consecrated man. That he was a faithful man. That he lived for God. And that he walked right before God. You know what it means to live or walk right before God, I prefer, look at me, I prefer to walk right before God than man. Because when you begin to please man and try to please everybody, you lose your identity in the midst of all that mess. When you try to please this person, this person, this person, you don't even know who you are. My job and your job is to please God. Now, by pleasing God, we're going to offend people. Okay, I just want to give you a heads up on that. When you and I want to live righteous lives, faithful to God, people are going to get upset. Who do you think you are? Why, are you more holier than me? Um, maybe. <laughs> it's possible. So the Bible says in verse 19 that uh, Joseph was a consecrated man, that he was a faithful man. Can I also say, if you're taking notes, that God is more concerned with your character than he is with your comfort. Many of us want to live character lives. We want to live lives that are righteous before God, yet our character doesn't reflect that. And in order for us to live lives that are holy before God, then that means you and I would have to go through a process of God building and making. We like God to use us. We don't like the process, but we like the product. We don't like this part. <laughs> this part here could take five years, two years, ten years, twenty years, process. It all depends on you. How much are you willing to give up? Because some of us, we're in this process, and then we step out of the process. like, I don't like it. And a couple years later, I need to go back to church. God, here I am. And like, I got to start all over again. For the love of God, stay in the process. Are you with me? So Joseph's character, the Bible says he was a consecrated man who lived for God. He, he walked before the Lord. In the year 2016, and as we face 2017, walk right before God. Just trying to coach you, teach you here today. Walk righteous before God. Another thing we find about his character, is not only was he a consecrated man, but he was a man of compassion. Compassion. You say, well, Pastor Choco, what made Joseph compassionate? Well, the Bible says 
in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if you could put that verse up, 22 here. Let's read this. First of all, look at me. What's the dilemma? Joseph, he has a predicament. He has a fiancé who's pregnant. She says to him, Papa, it's from the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if Joseph was from Humble Park and his fiancé, I got, man, I'm pregnant. And it's from the Holy Spirit. He's like, yeah, right. It's your ex, right? So you at least get the idea. You get the situation. He now has a fiancé who he's pledged to be married with, and she tells him, I'm pregnant, and it's from the Holy Spirit. Now, technically, Joseph had this law. Here's the law. Verse 20. Let's start there. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, verse 21, she should be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to what? To death. So Joseph does have an option. He has an option. And the option is, I'm going to take this woman back to her dad and say, your daughter's pregnant and it's not from me. She says it's from the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't throw her under the bus. So that what makes him compassionate is that he withholds himself to the plan. He believes the plan. He's not only a man of character, and what defines you as a woman or a man of character is that you're a compassionate person. Compassion. Not passion. Compassion. What builds your character is that you're a consecrated man. You're a consecrated woman. He was in the midst of crisis. Look at me. How you... How you and I respond to crisis reveals a lot about our character. Let me say that again. How you and I respond to crisis reveals a lot about who you are in the inside. Because when everything is doing good in your life, what's in the inside stays there. But the moment all hell breaks loose in your life, and those who are married, you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Because when all is hunkadory and there is no crisis in your life, you really don't know who he is or who she is. But the moment something happens, you can tell a lot about a person when crisis hits them and then what comes out of them. Cussing. When life squeezes you, something's going to come out. Right? I mean, how much do you have to squeeze that toothpaste? I mean, if you're like me, you're like to the last, you know, how many of you I'm talking about? You're like rolling that bad boy. There's more toothpaste in here in Jesus' name. Yeah. You rarely throw anything that's full out. You're going to squeeze that thing to get that toothpaste. And Joseph's character is coming out. When you're in a crisis, a man of compassion, a woman of compassion, a woman who's consecrated, a man who's consecrated. You know a lot about person and what they're made out of by crisis. Number two, what do we learn in Matthew chapter 1, not only do we learn about Joseph's character, but we learn about Joseph's call, his calling. When God calls you to do something, God's going to reveal things to you. You hear me? When God calls you to be a certain person, a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, a missionary, a pastor, when God calls you, you better know God calls you. Because you're going to go through hell. Come on now. Anybody who wants to be a doctor or, or a lawyer or whatever, you just can't go get a Captain Crunch box and get your degree out of Captain Crunch. No, you go through that process. And that process is lengthy. That process is hard. 
But it's a calling. What sustains you and I is a calling. Hey, Pastor Choco, how many times did you want to quit in the last 16 years? Every Sunday. I don't do it because it's a calling. It's not a passion. I'm always weary when people say, I got a passion for this. I got a passion for this. Passion is like a honeymoon. Come on now. He can do no wrong during the honeymoon. She can do no wrong during the honeymoon. His breathing is so romantic. You're like, oh, wow. Her breathing is so romantic. But the moment three or four years pass by, that wife is like, stop breathing. It's bothering me. Because the honeymoon is over. And what you and I are in, we're in this for the long haul. This is not, you know, if I feel it, if I'm going to church. No, I'm committed to the Lord. I'm committed to get closer to God. I'm committed to die to myself. I'm committed to the calling that God's placed upon my life. Whether I feel it or not, I'm going to church. Whether I feel it or not, I'm going to pray. Whether I feel it or not, I'm going to read the word. What we learn here is Joseph's calling. Verse 20. Number A, A, A. Verse 20. Well, let's go here for a moment. But after he has considered this. Let me put on the glasses here. <laughs> but I went to the eye doctor. And they said, you need glasses. I said, really? Papa, that's why I'm here. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So now, A, under Joseph's calling, the revelation of the person, son of David. I have called you directly. And each and every one of you all, you have a, God has a plan for you. And God has a specific calling that only you can fulfill. I can't fulfill your calling. You cannot fulfill my calling. Come on now. And if, um, imagine if you hold off on your calling. You said, no, I don't want to do my calling. Can you imagine if my wife, after 30 years worshiping with my father-in-law in this church, that she would say, no, I don't want to sing anymore. I mean, we would miss out on her calling. So verse 20 reveals the person. B, verse 21. It's a revelation of purpose. Watch this. Verse 21. She will give birth to what? <laughs> if Mary was one of those, like my daughter, you know, when Alex was pregnant, my daughter Alex, she, went, she didn't want to know the gender. We had to wait nine months if Mary was the same way like Alex, the angel messed it up. The angel said, Mama, you're going to have a boy. She's like, oh, man, I've been, I wanted just the mystery of it. Not only does he reveal the gender, but he reveals the purpose of this child in verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people. Not only am I giving you a plan, Joseph, but I'm going to tell you what your little boy is going to grow up to be. He's going to grow up with a purpose, and he will be a savior. The name Jesus means savior. Listen, y'all. If God thought you needed an accountant, he would have sent you one. If God thought you needed a therapist, nothing wrong with therapists, he would have sent you one. But he knew that you and I were not in need of an accountant or a therapist or a counselor. He knew that you and I would be in need of a savior. Amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Joseph, your calling is to raise this boy because your son will have purpose in his life and he will be the savior of the world. Glory to God. Amen. Purpose. That's a, it's, it's a darn shame to wake up tomorrow with no purpose in your life. You hear me? I don't know if you know anybody that just wakes up, I don't know what to do. And just waste days. Come on. You got you to gotta wake up tomorrow morning with purpose. Amen. Do something with the life that God has given you. If God can use Joseph in his introvert, because he seems like an introvert. He doesn't say anything through the whole thing. 
And God says, I can deal with the man of character. I can deal with the woman of character who's faithful, who's loyal, who's consecrated, who's compassionate, who doesn't throw his wife under the bus or his husband, her husband under the bus, who's got compassion towards the poor. God says, I can use somebody like that, and I'm going to reveal to them my purpose. And I'm going to give them my plan. Joseph. Listen, y'all, Joseph, in the midst of all this, looked for the face of God, for the plan of God. Do you hear me? He looked for the plan of God. And if God can use Joseph, that means there's hope for you and me. I like how, I like how Paul puts it in this way. Go ahead and put that up for me. First Timothy first, chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the Apostle Paul. I thank Christ our Lord Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointed me to his service, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy. You know what mercy means, right? Not getting what you deserve. Paul says, I will show mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Verse 14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save what? Sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would what? Who but what? Believe. believe. Who would believe? Thank the Lord that God doesn't pick somebody from a perfect family because I don't come from a perfect family. Amen. Thank God that God doesn't pick somebody that an alcoholic family because I come from an alcoholic family, a divorced family. Thank God. Paul saying, I am the worst of sinners. If God has a plan for Joseph and God has a plan for Paul, God has a plan for Choco. He has a plan for you. He's got 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 a plan. Glory to God. He reveals the plan so that you and I would walk. Joseph's character. Joseph's call. And lastly, Joseph's conduct. His conduct. Through this whole transition. Watch yourself, your conduct. This Christmas, conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy to the Lord. Conduct yourselves with kindness with people. Conduct yourself being honest. If you go to Target and you give a $20 bill and you get a change of $50, that you would conduct yourself and that you don't leave out and like, oh, glory to God. You may have been this evil. God has blessed me. The devil is a liar. No. No, your conduct is, hey, ma'am, you gave me more money than what I gave you. Then you become a witness, and your character is in display. And you have compassion to the person who's behind that cash register, because they're going to have to pay for that at the end of the day. You and I have the capacity. We have the opportunity this Christmas to be men and women of character, of compassion, and great conduct. Conduct yourselves in a way that is worthy to the Lord. Are you with me? Joseph believed the plan that God had for him. And he submitted his life, his body, his will as a plan. Let me throw you another scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, which is not on the screen. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says this. For the weapons, the Hebrew word for weapon is hoplon. 
Hoplon, for the weapons of our warfare are not cardinal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Did you hear me? Weapons. The word weapons, weapons in, in Greek, rather, the Greek word weapon means instrument. So if you take the word weapon out and you put the word instrument, that means that God uses people as instruments. That's you and me. I'm an instrument. You're an instrument. That instrument has to be fine-tuned. Can you imagine picking up a guitar that hasn't been picked up in two years or six months? You have to tighten up the chords or even change the chords for that matter. So if God's going to use you in the year 2017, tell God to pick you up, take out the chords, deal with my character, deal with my heart of compassion, and deal with my conduct, Lord. Do whatever you have to do to fine-tune me so when you do play me, there's a good music coming out of my life. Good music coming out. That when you and I pass away, that people would say, she was a faithful woman to the Lord. He was a faithful man. Always in church. Faithful. The Bible says, and Joseph was a faithful dude. It doesn't say dude, but he died. You get the idea. Stand with me this afternoon for a moment. Stand with me. Let's be honest for a moment. Every single one of us here have a will. And I, I had a plan. I share this many times with you all as church members. I had my own will. I wanted to be a state trooper for Illinois. Took the exam and everything. Passed it. So I had my own will. I had my own desire to be a state trooper. But God had a different plan for me. I'm so glad because his plans are better than my plan. Because if had I walked away from what he had, there will not be this building. It would not be the dream center. It would not be the teen center. No John Hanna campuses. So you must submit to the will of God. It's painful. You must lay down your dreams and say, God, I'll pick this up. Even though it doesn't make sense that my fiance is pregnant and the law says I could stone her, but I will not do that. I'm going to take her in. I'm going to take on this mission. I'm going to take on this ministry on my life. I'm going to raise this boy to be a boy of character, a boy of compassion, a boy of conduct. That's awesome. See, if you see your life as an instrument, there are instruments that you, we find that are not being used. But boy, imagine if you can just... Let God fine-tune you, clean you up. Say, God, if you can use Paul, the worst of sinners, and you can use Joseph, and you can use Pastor Choco, you could use me. Amen. And he can. I believe the plan. I believe the plan. And I believe God has a purpose. With every head bowed and every eyes closed.